is a senior attending physician at the pediatric uh, and pediatric urologist at Sidra uh, Medicine in Doha, Qatar. Uh, he's a former, a former associate uh, professor of clinical surgery and the program director of the urology residency uh, training at the American University of Beirut in Lebanon. Thank you, Dr. Rami, for your introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here in the vibrant city of Dubai. Uh, it's uh, an opportunity always to meet uh, old friends and make new ones. And I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me uh, to talk today. Uh, my topic would be about the future of pediatric urology and where is this specialty as well as many other specialties in, in medicine and surgery are heading. Unfortunately, I have no financial disclosures. Uh, so uh, the learning objectives is this presentation aims to fast forward uh, the prospective adva advancements in science and predict the future of pediatric urology practice while trying to stay objective and away from the temptation of uh, science fiction. So to start, it is estimated that the doubling time of medical knowledge in the 1950 uh, was 50 years. In the 1980, it was seven years. In 2010, it was 3.5 years. And uh, that article uh, was in uh, 2011, so it predicted that in 2020, it's projected to, to be 0 0.2 years. So medical knowledge doubles in 73 days. Imagine how much change would happen uh, with this space. So if you look into this painting that was uh, uh, by Thomas Aikens, who's a, an American painter, who was uh, drawing the painting, the clinic of Dr. Agnew. Uh, he was showing uh, actually a surgeon uh, doing a partial mastectomy uh, in a theater with men watching all in suits. Uh, and at that time, that was uh, the epitome of, uh, of, of surgery uh, and uh, both the practice as well as teaching. Fast forward that uh, to 2021, it's similar picture, but it's a Zoom meeting and uh, it Actually, we were forced all into doing that with the, with the COVID pandemic. Again, uh, on the, uh, this side of, of, the, of the slide, lowermost uh, uh, picture is actually uh, my clinic when I was a fellow. We were still using paper records and uh, it was really very difficult to document and, uh, and be accurate in, in uh, recording every single detail of the patient and then going to the medical records, trying to fetch out some of those uh, medical records was very difficult. Apply that to, uh, to auditing and research and then fast forward that now and you find the electronic health records where it is easy to document as well as come back and, uh, and analyze your outcomes. In addition to the uh, 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 multiple apps that has been uh, uh, an adjunct to medical records, including the apps of uh, communication, apps of x-rays, packs, etc. So let's talk about uh, the players that are actually driving the, uh, the progress of, uh, of urology as well as any other specialty. So uh, cultures and, and uh, the human race is experiencing an economic boom. Uh, and this boom actually goes into a crisis. There's a rise of megapolis cities Dubai is one of them, for example. And, and then now we're faced with the pandemic, maybe more to come. 
This had led to many other uh, variables, such as global warming and climate change, pollution, and uh, uh, problems of uh, getting rid of multiple wastes that had led to hormonal disruptors, uh, cost challenges, and further going into antibiotic resistances, a decline in immunity of, of uh, patients, uh, pediatric population also being a, a particular vulnerable uh, population. Uh, the childhood cancers are on a rise. Uh, congenital anomalies are on a rise. And in addition to that, there's a challenge of training because again, with the, with the advances in science uh, and subspecialization, there's the challenge of uh, finding teaching material and, and clinical opportunities for trainees to master their, uh, their craft. And uh, again, the uh, challenges of access to healthcare, both for a, for a trainee as well as for a, for a patient. Uh, all those factors uh, are the players that can uh, influence how a specialty as, such as urology can, can progress. And in fact, if you look into some pertinent examples, one of them is hypospadias. Hypospadias is a common congenital anomaly with an increasing incidence, probably because of uh, many variables that I alluded to. One of them are the hormonal disruptors that we see them in many food additives as well as uh, uh, now with the, with the advances in assisted reproduction, uh, many uh, women will go through hormonal induction uh, 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 and induction, induction of ovulation leading to twinning and with twinning placental insufficiencies. And it's known that placental insufficiency and oxygen tension in a certain critical time of uh, fetal development has increased congenital anomalies, particularly hypospadias. And you can see that in the 1970s, the incidence of hypospadias was one in 500. Uh, nowadays, we're talking about it's down to uh, one in 150. Another example is childhood obesity. Uh, our children are eating junk foods. They're not playing sports. They're uh, on their uh, uh, electronic devices all the time. And actually, as we can document a an alarming trend in increase in their weights, and this has an impact into their health, rise in diabetes, rise in hypertension, kidney stones, renal insufficiencies, and uh, the list goes on. So we go into some brighter pictures of, of this uh, uh, future, technological advances, uh, particularly prenatal diagnosis with ultrasounds, uh, has made us be able uh, to <clears throat> diagnose many anomalies in fetal life. And uh, one of the key studies is the Eurofetus study. Uh, it's a study that was published uh, in 2003, uh, looking into six centers of Europe uh, with over 200,000 patients. And actually, we're good in uh, detecting anomalies in 61% of the times. And uh, GU anomalies are doing very well, better than heart anomalies, for example. We can detect anomalies in around 90% of the time in fetuses, compared to cardiac in around 50% of the time. But again, with the, with the advances in technology and with the more powerful transducers of ultrasounds, 3D reconstruction, elastographies, other things, you can actually see nicely how the 3D reconstruction of the face of the fetus can very nicely uh, correspond to their postnatal uh, picture, very accurate. Again, we can diagnose many congenital pediatric urological anomalies uh, with, uh, with prenatal diagnosis and can be confirmed postnatally. Uh, such as UPJ stenosis, uh, and uh, can differentiate that from other differential diagnoses, such as multicystic dysplastic kidneys. Uh, but again, some of the alarming and, and the critical diagnoses, such as posterior urethral valves, uh, 
those patients that would require an immediate intervention postnatally, and if uh, so, you can actually uh, improve outcome by trying to delay their progress into renal failure. So being aware of a, of a fetus that has posterior urethral valves prenatally with seeing thickened bladder or a massive bladder or the keyhole sign of the bladder can actually alert us uh, to expect a newborn with a serious anomaly and we can actually uh, uh, surgically uh, ablate that. Uh, this is more uh, picture. Actually, this was one of our patients uh, that we uh, knew about her uh, uh, bladder extrophy uh, prenatally. This is a 3D reconstruction, and you can actually uh, see the bladder plate uh, that is uh, superior to the labia majora. So this is a female bladder extrophy patient and the umbilical cord on top. And actually, this patient is now uh, one week post-op prepare. Uh, that was done at uh, three days of life. Another uh, technological advance uh, in, in pediatric urology is in stone management. Uh, one uh, is the advancement in the fiber optic technology, so we are able now to send light as well as an image through a curved, through a malleable uh, uh, endoscope, uh, and we are able to acquire uh, digital images. We are able to miniaturize the ureteroscopes uh, so that we can enter the delicate ureter of a, of a baby or even a child. So now we can have a semi-rigid ureteroscope as uh, uh, fine as 4.5 French. And we can use the laser as an energy modality to blast the stone. Uh, also flexible scopes are now uh, uh, equipped with an extreme deflection. It can deflect now 270 degrees. So it can actually, you can nav navigate through the collecting systems and the calices of, or chambers of the, of the kidney and be able to find stones and blast them with the laser. Uh, also endoscopic uh, uh, percutaneous approach is, is advancing and now you can access the kidney through a, a very fine uh, tract as down as uh, uh, four or even five French. So it has gone from the conventional percutaneous uh, uh, nephrolithotomy uh, to the mini uh, PCNL, to the ultra mini PCNL, and now to the micro PCNL. So you can have actually barely any, uh, any uh, incision in the skin and uh, better clearance of uh, the stones with a, with a laser and other energy modalities. So another advancement in surgical uh, uh, urology is robotic surgery. Probably all of us here are aware of the uh, Da Vinci robot, which is now mainstream in adult urology, but with, with uh, growing applicability to pediatric urology. And now more and more uh, prototypes of miniature robots are being uh, advances and uh, ports as well as smaller instruments can be tailored to, uh, to suit the smaller pediatric patient. You can see on one side uh, some steps of doing a robotic pyloplasty uh, uh, for, and, uh, for one of the pediatric patients. And in any surgical advance, you always have this cycle of uh, trying to push the envelope. Can I do it? So we always challenge ourselves into doing any new novel procedure. And then from that, we go in, should I do it? And should I stop doing it? And this cycle will lead us to uh, adopt procedures that are suitable versus others that will rise and fall. So in addition to using the robot platform to uh, do surgery, Robotic associated technology is also on the rise. One of them is augmented reality. So actually looking into the monitor while doing robotic surgery, you can embed 
on your vision the imaging of that patient. For example, a CT scan or an MRI finding that you can embed into uh, uh, see the, this picture. You can see the vessels, the tumors, and, and that will actually help you in doing the surgery. The fire for fly technology where you can actually fluoresce vessels while you're doing the surgery, and that will allow you to, uh, to avoid doing vascular injuries. And now with the advancement in, in, uh, in internet with the, with the 5G high-speed streaming, you can actually do remote surgery. So somebody in, in a country can actually perform robotic surgery to a patient in another country uh, with, with the robot technology. But uh, before that, you can actually use the, the, the telemonitoring where you can actually, while you're doing the surgery, somebody can monitor what you're doing. And telementoring, you can actually teach somebody doing the surgery w w while you're in your office drinking coffee. So is artificial intelligence uh, coming, going to become the new surgeon? So the relationship between the surgeon and the robot was initially a master-slave relationship. So I basically, I am the one that moves the robot. The robot obeys my hand movements. But now it's actually evolving into becoming a pilot-co-pilot -pilot relationship, where the robot is not my slave, but actually is my assistant. And this has actually been advancing in many uh, uh, industries and many practices. For example, aviation, where uh, the plane landing is now uh, part of AI technology. Or even car technology, now uh, the car can actually park if it takes images of the parking lot you can actually put the car in a, in a parking mode. It will park for you. So uh, it is not far away from surgery as well. So uh, now the robot can actually do on-screen checklist of a surgery before you start it. It can detect risky situations by assessing deform deformability of structure. So if you're about to injure a vital structure, the robot can alert you that you're going, in, going into danger, and it can actually perform predictable procedures. So I can teach the robot how to do an, an, an anastomosis of a pyloplasty, and then the robot will do it for me, or even doing a urethroplasty similarly. Or you can teach the robot to do a biopsy of a tumor, and then it will take charge of that. And that relationship of pilot-co-pilot -pilot can switch into co-pilot pilot. So I'll be the one assisting the robot do the surgery. Instead, the robot assisting me, and maybe in in few tens of years, uh, the surgery, the surgeon as a role, will become uh, negligible, and and surgery will be taken charge for by robots, maybe humanoid robots. It's not far away. Maybe in not not in our times. But it's probably going to happen. So again, I touched into the training challenges uh, with, with, uh, with technology. You can see the first picture is learning how to aviate a plane. But even in surgery, you, you need to learn how to practice by simulation. And this simulation can be a high fidelity simulation where you can actually have a model that is very close to reality to train on, but also low fidelity model. For, for example, somebody repairing a heart valve by having a piece of styrofoam in a, in a part of a can, and you can actually practice doing a valve uh, plasty. We have at actually low fidelity models are validated, and they are similar to high fidelity models in sk skill acquisition. Uh, this is, was one of the models that I was part in developing, which is a kidney model to, to, to teach uh, pyloplasty. Simply get a ping pong ball, put it inside a balloon, uh, fill it with, a, with a, a red solution, and then put another balloon, fill it with water or other uh, solutions. And you can actually get a Penrose drain 
open an incision in the outer balloon without injuring the inner balloon and do your anastomosis. And this will actually, is like doing a pyeloplasty. We have actually validated that this model is good enough to teach uh, surgery. Five but, minutes, please. But now with, with the training challenges uh, uh, and the, 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 the robot technology has allowed us to, to provide the platforms for teaching, 3D printing uh, has allowed us to appreciate uh, complex structures and uh, intricate anomaly, for example, blood, uh, bladder extrophy or hypospadias can be 3D printed as a training uh, opportunity. One thing that has caused a paradigm shift is genetics and genetic uh, improvement. Uh, so in the uh, 2000, uh, the New York Times has uh, uh, had headlines of the genetic code of the human life is cracked by scientists. And now we can actually, with pharmacogenomics, we can edit the genes and cure childhood cancers such as Wilms, etc. Also, we can, we can, with the CRISPR uh, uh, gene editing, we can remove the blood group and render, for example, an, a kidney as blood group O and expand the donor pool. Regenerative medicine is also an advancement, stem cells, where you can differentiate or de-differentiate somatic cells into stem cells. And this has allowed for generation of bladder neck elastic muscles for extrophy bladder, spermatogonia in childhood cancer survival and fertility, skin or oral mucosa for hypospadias cripples, Tissue engineering is advancing bladder substitutes in neurogenic bladders and cavernous tissue in penile loss. Organoids have been advanced with bio 3D printing, so you can actually create organelles to produce certain functions. Liquid biopsies and biomarkers are also on the rise, so you can actually have a bio body fluid with a certain uh, uh, proteomic or metabolomic a signature, and it can be correlated to pathologies or pathologies such as cancer, obstruction, fibrosis, and this would avoid solid biopsies and reduce the need for more images. Huge data where you can actually acquire and analyze extensive and exhaustive population data, and by predicting patterns, machine learning, create algorithm and neural network, and lead to deep learning. And this has allowed us, for example, to synthesize a DMSA from ultrasound or recognize a stone composition just from the endoscopic view of the stone and predict outcome for vesicurator reflux and others. So what's the future? Future is actually precision medicine where one size fits all medicine which is stratified into a personalized medicine with the help of huge data genomics, and biomarkers. In conclusion, where there is no electricity, there is no ele technology. So this is a picture of planet Earth at night. There are many places on Earth that is still dark. And my talk today is irrelevant for this part of Earth. So don't stay for technology. Remember that 5 billion people have no access to safe and affordable health care. So what's the two-sided pediatric urologist is a multifaceted pediatric urologist who closely coordinates with the data manager, with the bioengineer, with the AI specialist, and with the genetist specialist, without forgetting the human factor, with communication, learning to deal with mistakes, care, humanity, and keep drinking coffee. Thank you.